So let me begin by briefly reviewing what we got last time. So we had this ratio of the numerator over denominator. Okay, this is taken to be of the following form. assume that this action as well as this upper O of U has uh, gauge invariance. So gauge invariance of course in course because in this case we are considering a finite dimensional symmetry. Nevertheless we assume that there is a symmetry under Ui goes to Ui prime. So Ui goes to Ui prime to be a phi of u theta okay. and o of u time is o of u and a sub u time is equal to a sub u where theta are the symmetry generator parameters level in symmetric algebra. And we further assume that the measure is invariant and that symmetry, namely this is the same as d u i prime. From these assumptions, we showed that the numerator and denominator can be manipulated to be of the following form. So n can be written as integral product over a d theta a determinant of a sub theta. Okay, I'll not write again the expression for s in some matrix. And then we wrote down the expressions for n prime and d prime. Okay, so let me write those. So n prime was given by integral Prime had a similar expression. Well, let me write down M. So M was a matrix, M A B was given by del H in F of Q phi del phi B at phi equal to 0. Okay, and I'll use a short term notation that H phi. So the idea here was that this integral, of course, is a high dimension integral, but there are some directions 
in this place of integration along with the H of U doesn't change. Okay, and integration over those directions typically produce divergence, both in the numerator and the denominator. Okay. And by following the procedure that we did yesterday, we factored out the integration over the group transformations. Okay, so that's here. And then we wrote down new expressions, n prime and d prime, which has the original integrals, but it also has a set of delta functions, which reduces the dimension of integration okay, by precisely the amount by which you have, by which this increases. Okay. So total dimension, of course, remains unchanged, but we just organize this full integral over UIs, okay, which are n variables, into m variables which are along the gauge direction, which are along the direction of symmetry, and n minus m variables which are here. So the idea is that this integral now should be well defined because this doesn't have any direction along which case of u remains constant. So you should be able to <coughs> work with this integral and get finite answers. However, the problem is that in this form, it's not always easy to derive, I mean, write down Feynman rules. Okay, when you apply it to uh, field theories or gauge theories, it's not always easy to write down Feynman rules because you know how to write down Feynman rules when you have expressions like this. It will be I S of U times O of U. These don't have typically that form. Okay. Now, in some cases, it may happen that these H's are simple. Okay, it just sets some fields to zero. Okay, in which case we can use it to, we just set those fields to zero and derive the Feynman rules as before. Even then you have to worry about this determinant. But these, for certain choice of gauge, these at least can be simplified. But we'll consider a more generic case where even we will not assume that even these can be simplified. Okay? That we'll assume that this is not of the form where it just sets some fields to zero. Okay, it may be some nonlinear combination of fields which are setting to zero. And it's not easy to eliminate one field in terms of the others to write it in terms of a set of independent integrals. Okay, and derive Feynman rules. So we'll try to see if there's a more general procedure by which you can handle this and develop the usual contribution theory based on Feynman rules. Yes. Um, so after this procedure is done, mm -hmm. you don't need to so the gauge Directions that those directions are gone, yes. so you don't need to fix a gauge anymore. Yeah, we don't need to fix a gauge anymore. So, in this part, this should be well defined, you don't need to fix a gauge anymore. Yes. Okay. But now we just want to make it more convenient to do this integral, yes. right? so that you can apply Feynman rules and the usual rules of perturbation theory. So, for example, this delta when you calculate it, you can yes. calculate it with any, I mean, these choice of values. Yes, so, so we can calculate. I mean, once HA is given. See, the argument is, of course, it, this doesn't depend on the files, right? Because you just calculate the derivative and set phi equal to zero. So it only requires infinitesimal transformation of the fields. Okay. But m will depend on the on these functions, choice of functions, right? So in principle, if it has a finite dimensional integral, this would have been enough, right? You just uh, do this integral. If you are just trying to do this integral on a computer, you could just set, put this on a computer and uh, do this, right? But we want to evaluate it using perturbation theory. Right? And for perturbation theory, you have seen how to handle this if there is an action which has a quadratic piece plus higher order pieces. Right? Then you calculate the propagator for the quadratic piece and then the higher order piece you expand as perturbation. That procedure is not directly applicable on, once you have extra factors like this. Right? So you want to see whether these extra factors can be somehow massaged to, in a, uh, to be brought into a form where you can apply the usual procedure. Of Is this clear? Okay, now if we look at this expression <coughs> n, the original expression for n that we wrote down, okay, which was just up to this part. Okay. 
That had no knowledge about HA or DA. Because those are introduced afterwards. So the original N is clearly independent of BA. Right? Let's focus on the BA. Okay. The original N was clearly independent of BA because there's no notion of B anywhere. Yeah. Now if you look at this integral over here, this is this is this factor. So we can put factors out from here. Okay. This factor is purely a group theory factor. Okay, we, we, uh, we define this uh, a sub theta, right? calculation of a sub theta. Okay, it may be complicated, but it's fixed by the uh, uh, group structure. So this also has no knowledge about BA. Okay. So this means that the n prime should also be independent of BA. Okay. Although if you look at the expression for n prime, it doesn't look like it's independent of BA. Okay, it looks like it does depend on BA. It also depends on the choice of the function HA. Okay. But from our general consideration, we know that, that cannot be the case. Right? Because neither did N depend on this data, okay, the choice of H or D, okay. nor does this factor depend on the choice of H or D. Is that clear? Okay. So this is a, a, a observation that we are now going to use. So since n prime, so n prime is independent of dA, yes, n prime contains b. So by looking at this, you don't see that it's independent of dA. Okay, but n prime is related to n and this integral by this relation. Okay, the n prime arrows because of this. n doesn't depend on b. Right? Because n was a, an integral of this kind. Okay, that certainly had no knowledge about b. Neither does this integral have any knowledge about b. So this shows that n prime, even though it looks like it depends on b, is actually independent of b. Is that clear? Yeah, so, so that's what you are going to make use of. Okay, that even though it looks like it depends on DA, it cannot depend, actually depend on DA. And using that, we will try to now simplify both N prime and D prime. So let's define N double prime as the following object. This is summed over index. This index is summed over, so it's, uh, it's repeated index with sum. Okay, I can write sum over C. This is C. So this, because the result doesn't depend on B A, n prime doesn't depend on B A. Okay, I, I can just take n prime out of the integral. So this is just n prime times this integral. Now this integral looks oscillatory, but you can make it well defined. So alpha naught, so you can take and make it well defined. is some real number. Okay. So this is oscillatory, but if you replace alpha naught inverse by alpha naught inverse minus i epsilon, then it, you can see it, there's a convergence piece. Okay. It will be minus epsilon bc bc, so that's certainly convergent. So you can make this well defined, okay. but then you can also check that in the epsilon goes to zero limit, this has uh, this is perfectly well defined. Is this clear? We define D 
double prime in the same way. Then it's clear that n double prime over d double prime is n prime over d prime. Okay, because these are just factors that multiply the n prime and the d prime, these are independent of the n. And so the ratios must be the same. This wouldn't be the case if this is dependent on the n, right? So it's important that these do not depend on the n. Otherwise, you couldn't have just factored it out. Is this clear? Clear or not clear? Okay. Okay. So now we are going to substitute this expression for n prime. Which we know implicitly that it doesn't depend on dA, but it has a manifest dA sitting inside. So n double prime, okay, a similar thing can be done for d as well. So the integral to that over d. Okay, I have just substituted this expression for n prime in this integral over here. <coughs> no, it doesn't depend on either the choice of H or the choice of D. They can be chosen independently. Okay. In fact, I could have defined this whole thing to be H. Okay, which could be just chosen to be independent function. Right? I wrote it as H M minus B S for some specific purpose, and we'll see why that's true now. But n prime is independent of H as well as D A. Okay, because or neither n dependent on H or D A, nor did that integral over the group volume dependent on H or D A. No, they are independently chosen. So for fixed H, you can choose B to be anything that you like. Is this clear? But now what we are going to do is that we, will, we are going to change the order of integration over u and b and write this as an integral product over i b u i then you have product over a d b a but these integrals I am going to do using these delta functions right so the effect of integrating over b a will be to simply replace b a by h of u so we get now e to the i a sub u minus i over 2 alpha naught sum over c dc dc sorry hc of u hc of 
And B double prime similarly is the same thing without OU. So what I have done by this procedure is that this delta function has now gone. The integration, instead of being over a reduced number of variables, now it has gone back to the original number of variables because now we have gotten back to all the integrals. Okay. And this arrows because of this BA integral, the extra BA integral that we introduced, right? So you have now number of integration variables now you have gone back to the original number. But Effectively, we have added a new term in the action, okay. which is not gauge invariant. Okay. There, this term has no reason to be gauge invariant. In fact, HC has to be chosen, so it is not gauge invariant. Okay. So now we are solving the problem. So this action also shouldn't have that problem because, after all, this exp the original exp n prime didn't have a problem, right? So this also shouldn't have a problem. Okay. But the way that this doesn't have a problem is not because you have reduced the number of variables. But because we have kept the same number of variables but added a term in the action which explicitly breaks gauge invariance. So once you have added a term in the action which doesn't have gauge invariance, right, then of course the problem that we had faced earlier shouldn't be there. Right? Because that problem was coming because the action had a uh, flat direction. Right? There are some changes of the field that you are making along which the action doesn't change. That's not true anymore. Okay? This will not change along those directions, but this will. So in this form, then both of these can be treated by using the Feynman diagram methods. Okay? So we will split the whole action now into the free part, which is the quadratic part and the interaction part, and then treat the interaction part as a normal part of it. But you still have this determinant of f. Right? You have to see how to handle this determinant of f. Yes. Well, I mean, you are supposed to use only gauge invariant operators. This action is useless for as far as the original theory is concerned, right? The equivalence between the original uh, expression and this expression okay. is true only if O of u is gauge invariant, right? You have used it in our manipulation. What it guarantees is that as long as O of is a gauge invariant, right, then this action gives you exactly the same thing that you are trying to calculate originally. <coughs> is that point here? But this is arbitrary, right? H are arbitrary. So what is guaranteed is that the that if you choose O to be gauge invariant, yes. then the result shouldn't depend on the choice of H. Right? Because it is equal to what we had earlier which didn't depend on the choice of H. But if you take O to be non-gauge invariant operator, then it will depend on the choice of H. <coughs> so you can calculate them. Okay, and you will see that indeed with this, we can calculate the mu nu propagator in uh, electrodynamics, okay. which we couldn't calculate earlier, okay, because they are not well defined. So you can calculate mu nu propagator, except that by itself it has no meaning. Okay? Because it, that could be changed if you change your gauge, if you change your H. What will not change is that if you take this mu nu two point function and from that you can calculate now f mu nu f rho sigma two point function, that will be the same irrespective of what gauge you have chosen. Is this clear? Yeah, so that's what is guaranteed that as long as O of u is gauge invariant, even though we have broken gauge invariance by adding this explicit term in the action, okay. the result doesn't depend on the choice of gauge. Okay? Irrespective of the choice of H, you will get the same result. Okay? In fact, it will be compensated by this M. Okay? M also depends on the choice of H. Okay? That's why this M is necessary. Okay? Without this M, you would of course get different results. As we saw in the 
that uh, two dimensional example, right? That the integral, if you just fix a gauge slice, right, and try to do integrals, you are not going to get the correct result. Is this We cannot use yet. Yeah. So as yet we still cannot use perturbation theory because of the presence of determinant m. So we'll now see how to handle this determinant m. Okay, we want to also manipulate this so that we can use perturbation theory. Well, B A integral is you just think of B as a set of real variables, m real variables, right? We had m parameters. So you introduce m real variables, and you are just integrating around those m real variables. Right? This by itself, this doesn't know anything about gauge invariant. Right? You are just doing integrations over m real variables. Okay, and you are using the mathematical identity that this is some finite quantity. Right? If you use this replacement by which you are multiplying d prime, the same finite quantity is multiplying n prime to get n double prime. So you take the ratio of n double prime over d double prime, it just cancels. So by itself, at this stage, the BA integral has no particular meaning. It's just the integration of what is some variables that you have introduced. So that inside that, uh, in that n double prime, uh, the integration of what i is up to some n minus m? Integration of i, yes. I, I, no, i runs from 1 to n. Okay. Because it became n minus m because of the delta functions. See, this integral is still over n variables, okay. but effectively we have now reduced the number of integration variables because of the m delta function. So a runs from 1 to m. Okay. This is what reduces the delta function. Now we are introducing back m more integrals because we just introduce this by hand. Okay. So now the total number of integrations that we'll get at the end after you have used up the delta function is still n. Right? Because we had n minus m and then we added m by hand. Right? These are not gauge directions, these are just some arbitrary variables over which you are integrating. Okay? But it is guaranteed that whatever you are getting at the end here okay, is going to produce the correct correlation function of O as long as O is gauge invariant. Okay? Is this okay? Instead of one one. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that quantity was gauge invariant. One, of course, is always gauge invariant, right? right? One is one, right? <laughs> so it doesn't depend on choice of anything. So now how it becomes uh, gauge? Now how it is, it is becoming that it is not gauge invariant. What is not gauge invariant? No, no. HA was not gauge invariant. See, HA was chosen to be m arbitrary functions, right? And its property was that under a gauge transformation, it should change, right? Otherwise, you are not choosing a gauge, uh, 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 gauge slice, right? You want to choose a gauge slice, which should be transverse to the gauge orbit, right? Which means that if you fix the value of H here, if you make a gauge transformation, H should change. Okay. So HS by construction are not gauge invariant, right? Otherwise, the choice of HS are completely arbitrary for us, right? We introduce M arbitrary functions H A. And we wrote one as some integral, which has an identity, and then just manipulated that. By manipulating that, we managed to take out this factor, which I have erased now, the integral over theta, right? so m variables, group variables. That was independent of the choice of h. If you look at the actual formula for s of theta, right? the, the determinant of s, that didn't depend on h, right? nor did it depend on b. It was simply a property of how the group transformations compose. Right. So if you look at, at an intermediate stage, right, it will look like the things are dependent on the choice of gauge. Okay. But if you keep in mind that the original expression was independent of the choice of gauge, and then you factor it onto, into two parts, one part was manifestly independent of the choice of gauge, choice of HA, then the other part must also be independent of the choice of H, even though it doesn't look like it's choice of H. It's independent of the choice of H. Okay. So here the idea that HA certainly is not gauge invariant. Okay, otherwise it will not fix gauge. Right? 
the idea of introducing HA so that was that you choose a gauge slice. Is this clear? So the point is that any intermediate state, it will look like the things depend on the choice of gauge, you are doing something wrong, but you have to keep in mind where it came from. Right? In this form of this n prime integral, it's certainly not clear that it's independent of a choice of B or H. Yeah, there's an explicit delta function sitting inside. Is this okay? It will take care, yeah. When we know that it is taking care of it, because original expression was independent of the choice of H. When you define the in double prime, then you could have defined something in E to the power minus that such and some function of H, B. Yes, I could. I could. I could. You are saying that here I could multiply some FC. Or otherwise, x times e to the power. Yes, I could. They don't factor out from the numerator and denominator. But if it is dependent on f b a, then how? If it's dependent on f b a, yeah. Even then, this is independent of b a anyway, right? So if you multiply by f b a, it's still a constant factor by which you which you're multiplying. No, no, that this part will be okay, but when you go here, here you will be in a f of b a sitting inside. That yes. will be f of h. That will be f of h. So it is guaranteed to be independent of h at the end. But the point is that will not help you in developing part of the theory. Right? So that's why I want to take that f, what you're calling f is basically this. I mean, I have chosen this specifically. Right? So that eventually you can re reinterpret this as a term in the action and do part of the theory. Right? But, but from the general uh, procedure, it's guaranteed that you could have made this into any function of the beast. Okay? And by the same logic, it will cancel, right? For instead of, I mean, the result is that instead of getting this e to the minus i times this, you will get that, that function of hc. If that function of hc doesn't have a convenient form for perturbation expansion, then you are not gaining much, right? So I have chosen that particular form so that you can do perturbation. Is this clear? But often you may have to use some f here. It multiplies this by hc. Which can still be amenable to perturbation theory. Suppose you take this FC to be some FC, you could then multiply this by FC. That will still have a quadratic, uh, I mean, uh, 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 form of a term added to the action. Is this okay? Okay, so now let's see what to do with the determinant M. So to handle determinant M, okay, we are going to introduce, introduce two states of class one variables. Okay, which are denoted by B A and C A with A running from one to m. Okay, exactly the same number of Gaussian variables as there are number of gauge parameters. Okay, and number of gauge fixing functions. Now let's consider the following integral. Okay, I'll just use some signs for later convenience, but this is not Take this to be minus i b a m a b c. Okay, again, sum of what a and b is like in this situation. Put that into my b into c. This 
this integral, so we had done earlier, right? For Grassmann variables, if you have a set of Grassmann variables, so what is the result for this integral? It is determinant of m up to a normalizing constant, right? So it's determinant of m times normalization. Okay, which basically means some i's and minus signs and so on. Okay, but otherwise this is exactly determinant here. So this is the identity you are going to use to replace determinant here. So I'll write this now. As an integral over so I erase the next line. Okay. So integral over product over i d q i. I erase this. Product over i d u i product over c d d c product over c d c d to the power i s minus i over two alpha naught d h a of u h a of u minus i dA. Times a constant. Which we don't care because that constant in any case cancel between numerator and denominator. Okay, that constant is this normalization that comes here. Pardon? I miss O of you. Thank you. O of you. Okay, D double prime will be the same thing without the O. Is this okay? okay? Now we are in proper shape because now what we are going to do is that we will interpret these as some new fields that we have introduced, new variables, okay, Grassmann variables. Okay. And now we have everything in the exponent. Okay? So we can use this for our quantum mechanics. Okay, so this would be the starting point, starting point of order. The determining condition, right? Yeah. Which is basically the condition that determinant m should be non zero. Yes. Right? Because h changing under gauge transformation means that uh, uh, del h del phi, right? that should be, uh, should have no zero eigenvalue, right? So that's the condition. Yes. At, I mean, this is this path integral expression, right? If you could actually calculate the path integral, then you will get the uh, correct result for gauge invariant, correlation functions of gauge invariant operators. Okay, and it will give exactly the same result as the original one. Okay. But the original one, in actually, part of theory, it has given divergence because of this fact that you have 
the flat directions, right? Then as you saw that once you have flat directions, the propagator is ill-defined, okay? And you cannot really do part rotation theory. But that expression in principle can be used if you are willing to do, for example, uh, lattice gauge theory. Okay, where you have a finite number of lattice points, the gauge loop is compact. So there you can use, I mean, people do use uh, 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 this formalism without gauge fix, okay, in lattice gauge theory. So it's not that that expression was ill-defined, okay? It's ill-defined in part rotation theory, okay? If you regularize, regulate the theory in another way by putting finite number of points, okay, and compact gauge loop, then it can be made sense of that original expression. Yes. HA does not fix the gauge completely. Yes. Suppose there is some gauge ambiguity. Even yeah. then it will not show up in perturbation. Well, the point is that if HA, it's a question of is it M having zero eigenvalue, right? What is necessary is that M shouldn't have a zero eigenvalue at a generic momentum. Right? A special momentum, you can always have zero eigenvalue. There's even a scalar field uh, uh, action, right? Phi box phi. A special momentum when k square is zero. Right? K square is M square. Then of course it has zero eigenvalue. Okay. But at a generic momentum, it shouldn't have zero eigenvalue. Right? That's when you say that you have gauge fix and then the part of motion theory is well defined. Okay. If this has zero eigenvalue at a generic momentum, okay. then you can see that there is again a problem, right? Because you cannot invert this matrix. So you cannot I mean, define a propagator. Yeah, I was asking more like we have this Grigor ambiguity and so on. Yeah. So those will not show up in part rotation theory. Those are like having multiple copies, right? If the yeah. uh, gauge slice intersects the gauge orbit multiple number of times, right? then you are uh, not doing things correctly. But those will not show up in the part rotation theory. Okay, because in part rotation theory, you are really doing small fluctuations, right? So you are not going very far anyway. Now let me say a few words about what we need to do to convert this to field theory and then give some examples. So when you go to field theory, if we want to make connection with what we have done here, we have to put the field theory on a finite lattice. And then eventually take the lattice spacing to uh, zero limit. So when you put finite field theory on a finite lattice, then the i goes to the level that involves fields. Okay, so you can run over all fields. The sum over i will run over all fields and lattice points. Okay, so let's say the fields carry level alpha, and lattice points carry level j0, j1, j2, j3. Okay, so the label i will stand for all of these. Okay, it will run over different fields as well as different uh, lattice points. Label a will run over gauge loop generators. Gauge loop generators, which is a finite number. Very like SU3 will have three generators, SU, sorry, SU2 will have three generators, SU3 will have eight generators, and so on, right? In general, SU n value n, n square minus one, but also lattice points. Okay, because at every point you have a different gauge, you have gauge round. So these are leveled by, say, A and J0. Now here I should perhaps just add, although it's not going to be relevant for what we are going to do, is that if we really want to consider gauge theory on a lattice, then there is a small subtlety in the sense that while the gauge group generators are really leveled by, or when the, when there is this index A, is really labeled by the gauge group generators and the lattice points. 
the fields, okay, in particular the gauge fields, okay, are labeled by again the number of gauge fields for each field there is an index. Okay, but gauge fields instead of living on lattice points actually live on links, okay, which are the links of the lattice, okay, the edges of the lattice. Okay, so this is a subtlety that you have to keep in mind, but this will not play any role in what we are going to do. Okay, so you don't really put the gauge fields, all the other fields are put at lattice points. But as far as gauge fields are concerned, you actually put them on the uh, links. Okay, that's the only way you can maintain gauge invariance in a uh, lattice size version of gauge fields. Yes, that factor will go away, but there will be many such factors. So the net effect will be non-zero. Right? Even when you take the lattice factor, that is still zero. Okay, but for us, we just proceed with this. Okay, it doesn't really make any difference in what we are going to say. Okay, so sum over i, then we'll go over to sum over j0, j1, j2, j3, and then sum over alpha. But this, in turn, can be interpreted as okay. So these are the lattice spaces. This is the notation you had introduced earlier, right? Delta is the lattice spacing for the time variable, and these are the lattice spacings for the space rate. Okay, so this sum over the lattice points goes over to integrals, but with this normalization factor. Is this clear? Similarly, sum over A, sum over A will go over to J3 and then sum over to small a. Okay, this is running over the gauge group generators, and this in turn will be again delta h1, h2, h3 integral d4x and then sum over x. Pardon? In case of lattice, what is J0? J0 is the lattice point in the time direction. So these are all running over integer values. Okay. So different values of J0 correspond to different integer uh, integers along the time direction. Okay. And the J1, J2, J3 are the integers along the space. Okay. 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 So this is the lattice spacing So now we can apply this to gauge theories. Okay, convert the original expression that we had into what we get in gauge theory. So the gauge double prime that we introduced okay, will now have the following structure. This will be d phi alpha d c a d c b. These are the integrals over the C and the B fields. Okay. You see that initially, earlier you had B of C A, right, capital A. Okay. That A index is now being reinterpreted as the small A index and also space index, all the space time indices, lattice indices, right. Those space time lattice indices are already hidden in this uh, uh, definition, right. This means that you are integrating over the values of C at each space time point. Right? That's the meaning of functional integral. Okay. So this is what we had earlier called product over A 
BC, right? This is what we had earlier called product over I D E Y. This alpha runs over all the fields, including gauge fields, matter fields, and everything else that is there in the problem. Okay, so that's what this path integral is about. Now we write down the rest of the expression. Time sum. Okay, this something is what we'll be after. Okay, how to write that sum? There will be product over alpha. Yes, there will be product over alpha. Thank you. There is a product over alpha and then product over a. So you have to introduce new fields. So BA and X and CA of X are new Grassmann fields, anti Grassmann value fields. Okay, so these are called the Padia form of both. Clearly, have very unusual properties because these are polymeric fields, they are anti commute, right? they are Grassmann valued fields, but they carry spin 0. Right? It has no yeah. vector index. In the A index is some internal index. Right? If you have SU3, for example, A is the adjunct of, is running over the generator of SU3. So these are scalars. As far as the space time Lorentz transformation property is concerned, these are just like scalar fields. Nevertheless, they are anti commuting. So this is in violation of what you normally know as the spin statistics theorem, which is that the integer spin fields are always commuting, okay, they are bosons, and half integer spin fields are formulas. Okay, that we are familiar with, right? Electron is a formula, right? Higgs particle is a boson and so on. These violate that. Okay. Nevertheless, it's not really violating that theorem because the spin statistics theorem refers to physical particles. Okay. These are auxiliary objects that you have introduced in order to write the express the determinant. Okay. But when, for example, you calculate the S matrix, we will not never calculate S matrix involving these objects okay. because these are just not physical particles. Another way of saying this is that the O of U, okay, that whose correlation function you are going to calculate. That depends on only the original fields. That doesn't depend on the host fields at all. Right? Or on, the, on this B and C fields. Okay. So these are auxiliary constructions. Okay. Nevertheless, they are called host fields because of this peculiar property that they, even though they are scalars, okay. they have anti commutation property. Okay. They are described by Grassmann value field. Is this clear? Okay, so now let's write down the is added terms to the action. So let me write an abstract notation here. Let me write here it will be I is total times two of you, and then I'll see what will here is total. So is total has three pieces. First is gauge invariant. Plus this will stand for gauge fixing term. And then the whole part. Okay, I'll explain the various parts in the light of what we discussed earlier. So this is gauge invariant. This was the original action, A sub u. Okay, that we started with. Okay, that 
had uh, full gauge invariance, that's what this paper represents. Okay. 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 Now, AK. Because of the A index, okay, runs over all the gate generators and all the space time. So when we represent it as in the field theory, this will go over to A T of X. But A runs over the number of generators. If we are considering S U N, A runs over n square minus one values. And why X? Because X delivers the lattice points. Right? In the continuum limit, it will become a continuous variable. In the discrete uh, situation, this will be just a lattice point. Okay. So, a, an example with which you will be working, okay, although I think you can consider any other example that you like, <coughs> is that H of x is del mu a mu by a of x. Okay, this is just one particular example, but you can take anything else. This is not gauge invariant in general, so this is uh, good enough for us. So we had, if you recall, minus i over 2 alpha naught at at. Yes, this case of gauge is valid for any type of groups. Okay. I mean, one way to test whether this is a kind of good gauge choice or not okay. is that you make whatever gauge choice you like, you calculate your uh, action, the full action. Then, if you find that the propagator is still not uh, non computable, if the kinetic term is still not invertible, then you know that uh, uh, you have not chosen the gauge correctly. Okay. For example, you cannot choose. An F mu loop here. If, if you take something made of F mu loop, okay, then you will find that your propagator is still not in part. Okay, so this goes over to minus i over 2 alpha naught. The sum over a has an integral. So there is a delta h1, h2, h3. And then integral d4x, h of x, h of x. <laughs> then minus i over 2 alpha naught I wrote as it is. There is a sum over a, right? Sum over a, I wrote as a sum over lattice sum and the sum over generators, and then that became an integral times sum over generators, and that's what. I have not written the sum over generator because there is a repeated index anyway. Okay, so it's summed over. Is this clear? So this is what I'll call I times S here. Yes, gauge fixing is minus, and I'll just absorb this into alpha naught and call this alpha. So one over alpha is by definition delta h1 h2 h3 over alpha naught. So this becomes minus one over two alpha integral before x.
Because if you have chosen HA to be del mu m u a of x, then it's del mu m u a of x, del mu m u a of x. Okay, so you can see that we are adding a quadratic term in the action. Okay, which is not manifestly gauge invariant. And so after you have added the quadratic term, there is a hope that now your candidate term is invertible and you can get non non trivial properties. Finally, you have to look at the host action. So let me write it here. S host is I have erased the uh, minus i b a m a b t. Right? That's how I have taken it. There are two sums over A and over B, so there are two integrals. So this will go over to minus i delta naught h or delta h1 h2 h3 square integral b4x b4y. Then here I write a delta of h a of x. This is functional derivative. And h, let me write this way. h a phi of x delta phi b and phi equal to 0 times c b of x. Rotation, let me remind you again. H A phi I define as H A of A of U phi. H phi. Okay. So we are using the exactly the same spirit. So H A phi of X. What this means is that you take H expression for H A, okay, which is in this case the del mu A. Okay. Transform by phi. Okay. An infinitesimal gauge transformation, make an infinitesimal gauge transformation okay. with parameter phi. That's what H of phi represents. Is this clear? Okay, I think when I do this example, it may become uh, clearer. Okay. But H of H of phi means okay. just follow this definition. This means that you take H A and transform U by an infinitesimal transformation. Right? Why infinitesimal? Because I ultimately have to set phi equal to zero. So you never have to go beyond infinitesimal transformation. Right? You only want a first derivative. Okay. So take the gauge fixing function, okay. transform it by an infinitesimal gauge transformation, parameterized by phi. That's what the meaning of h of phi, and then we take the functional derivative with respect to phi b. This would be phi b of y. And then multiply by c b of y. See, there is one little thing missing here. Anybody has a guess what is missing? One thing. One factor of delta H one space G one by yeah yes capital A and small yeah so this capital A I mean this was cap this was del H A del phi B right at phi equal to zero partial derivative here I have replaced it by functional derivative right. Now if you recall that the relationship between part the ordinary derivative and functional derivative has a one over Delta h1 h2 h3. Right? So there's a one factor of the one over delta h1 h2 h3. Okay. Yes. Sir. Yeah. 
Okay, it's not very important, but I mean to be absolutely clear. Yeah. Okay, so this basically removes one factor of this. Okay. And you are also going to remove this, the one single factor that is there, okay. simply by absorbing it into the definition of B and C. Okay, the overall normalization of the ghost action really has no relevance because the ghosts are never appearing inside O, right? This never uh, contains any ghost field. So if we just absorb some normalization constant inside the ghost field, right, all that changes is this normalization, right? But they just cancel between numerator and denominator anyway. Okay. So you'll absorb this into this one, you absorb into the definition of B and C. So this gives us a ghost action. Is ghost? Let me write it here. As sorry, this is not S ghost. This is I times S ghost. Okay, because the whole thing is equal to I times S, right? So this is I times S ghost. So S ghost is minus. Okay. Okay, I'll not try to calculate this explicitly so that it becomes a little clearer what this involves. So we choose H A equal to del mu anyway. In this case, yes, gauge fixing is minus one over two alpha integral d four x. Straightforward. This is H A H that has that parameter. S ghost is what we have to calculate. So this is minus integral g of x delta. Now, to calculate HA five, <coughs> HA is this. So we want to see how this transforms under a gauge transform generated by five. Right? So we have to first record how A will transforms under that gauge transform. Right? Then we just substitute it here. Okay. So A B way under an infinitesimal gauge transformation, this has the following transform. Right, del mu epsilon tilde i plus 
if a b c remember this is after you rescale the b mu by g right this also infinitesimal gauge transformation law that i got and epsilon also has a g inside it so this is our pi this is our pi here. so then delta aj which is del mu mu is just del mu of this then it's the original aj plus del mu of this so delta aj is minus box x plus delta a of x plus g f a b c Now I'll just write these as put a label x here because there is a y which is going to come in soon, right? So at this stage everything is all the derivatives etc. dependent on x. Okay, so these are all derivatives with respect to x. So this is h a under phi. Okay, I let me replace epsilon by phi. But I use the general notion phi. So let's do that. Okay, because phi is the infinitesimal gauge transformation parameter. Right? That was the general uh, convention that we are used. Now you see the delta a j phi of x, delta phi v of y. The first term gives you minus box x delta 4 of x minus y, right? Because we are differentiating phi x, functional derivative with respect to phi y. So delta 4 of x minus y, and then delta a b. The second term, again, when you <coughs> differentiate, okay, now of course phi b you are differentiating again, so this phi b will be removed, and again there will be delta 4 of x minus y. So plus B F A B C del X mu of delta four of X minus Y. Now we will substitute in this expression. So is equals will be given by integral d four x. 
four y. Okay, I'm going to my absorb the minus sign in this. Okay. So b a of x box x delta four of x minus y. It doesn't matter if I write C of y outside or inside because this, this is just the x variable anyway. Is this clear? Because of delta AB, I converted CB to CA. Then there's a minus 3 FABC integral D4x D4y. Okay, now the idea is that we will try to use this delta function to do the integral and I mean there are various ways to do this. Okay. The quickest way, okay, which you may feel a certain, uh, I mean somewhat uncomfortable about, okay, is that integral d4y okay, can be taken inside the derivative with respect to x, right? Because y and x are independent variables, right? So take the integral d4y inside the derivative and now you do the y integral by using this delta function. Okay. So what it does is you just set y equal to x. Okay. So this gives you integral d4x of x box x of ca of x. Okay, if you feel uncomfortable with this idea then you first do integration by parts to put this box on B. Then this has no derivative. Okay. Now you can easily do the Y integral. That sets CA Y equal to X. That and then you can again integrate by parts and bring it back on to C. Okay, these are entirely equivalent. The second one you can also do in the same way. Right. Take this integral d4y inside. Once you do this inter inside, again y integral can be done. It just sets y equal to x. Okay. So minus d f a b c Here it becomes CA because of the delta IV factor. Right? Here there is no delta IV factor. This is really CB as this line. Okay, but it's in fact easier to in integrate by parts. Okay, so here the derivative will act on two of these objects, right? So if you integrate by parts, you actually get a simpler Feynman rule. Okay, so this one I'll rewrite as integral d f a b c integral d 4 x del mu d a of x del mu Is this, yeah? Okay. So 
now we have got this whole action okay s gauge invariant plus s gauge fixing plus s goes and we can now do Feynman uh, uh, diagrams with this okay. because you can see that uh, first of all the once we add the gauge fixing term okay there is a quadrant new quadratic piece in that thing, which is not gauge invariant and we will see that this makes the pro uh, propagator very different so we can actually invert the kinetic operator for the gauge field and get a propagator for the ghost fields, this shows that this, the propagator for the ghost field is just 1 over box, right, which is 1 over k square. Okay, it's like a massless field. And it also has interaction with the here. Okay, so this will give the interaction terms. So next time we'll derive the Feynman rules Okay, based on this action that we have written down here. Okay. At this level, you can already see that why in QED things are simpler. Okay, in uh, quantum electrodynamics, there is no FABC. Right? This is zero. Okay. So they are also you have host fields. Okay, if you follow this procedure with this gauge, right, you have host fields, but the host fields do not interact with anything. Right? So it's as good as not having them. Okay, because they are not there in the external leg, they are not interacting with anything. Right? So you can just ignore them as far as quarter version theory is concerned. But you cannot do it in uh, general non orbital gauge theories. Even in QED, you may choose to want the different gauge. Right? Suppose you didn't want this gauge, okay, but you wanted to add some other term, say, uh, A mu A times A mu B. Something like this. Okay, I could have chosen H to be. Yes, something is wrong. Oh. The view index. Oh, I sorry. Again. Oh, okay. I can just take A mu. That will be simpler. No? Oh, there is no A index. Okay, I think I really have to do <laughs> A mu A mu A and A B mu A B mu. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay. So I could have chosen to work with a gauge like this. Right? If you work with a gauge like this, then what will happen? The quadratic term, of course, doesn't change, right? Because the quadratic term is still going to come from here. But there will be some more interaction terms in the gauge, in all the gauge fields, right? Because when you expand this, you will get cross terms between this and this, as well as this and this, right? There will be many uh, 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 more interaction terms. Okay. But at the same time, the ghost action will now be non trivial, right? Because when you calculate this uh, derivative of h with respect to phi, right? these will transform non trivially, right? And you will, of course, get the linear term that we got. Okay, from this variation, which is field independent, but you'll also get field dependent terms from here. Okay. And the idea is that even though the <coughs> Feynman rules have changed, okay. as long as you are looking at only gauge invariant uh, quantities, okay. the final answer will be such that these effects cancel each other. Okay, the new interactions that are involving introduced involving the gauge fields and the new interaction that you get from the ghost fields, okay, they should exactly cancel. And it is guaranteed by the procedure that you have followed because what you have shown is that as far as gauge invariant operators are concerned, you start with an expression which has no uh, violation of gauge invariance, right? We didn't introduce any additional uh, data there. Okay. By manipulating that expression, we have arrived at something okay, which depends on all this additional data, right? What gauge fixing term you have chosen. Okay. But because the original expression was independent of the choice of gauge fixing term, it must be that the final expression is independent of the choice of gauge fixing term. Okay. So, the effect of introducing change in the gauge fixing term must cancel at the end. Is this clear? Yeah? So, you can uh, choose any h accordingly determinant m is. Yes, as long as determinant m is non zero, you can choose any h. So that's the idea, right? You can work with any H, so you choose your convenient H and uh, work with that. 
proof. We'll also see a more direct proof because this is of course a formal proof. We start with something which doesn't depend on the data. So the final answer shouldn't depend on the data. But suppose somebody gave you this, the S invariant plus S gauge fixing plus S host. Okay, didn't tell you where it came from. Then you, of course, can calculate everything from there. Okay. But you have no idea what the notion of gauge invariant operator is, right? Because this theory doesn't have gauge invariant. So if somebody has given you the final theory okay, without telling you which gauge fixing action you started with, okay. then you wouldn't know how to re determine which operators are gauge invariant and which are not. Okay. It turns out that there is an intrinsic way of determining which operators are good operators and which are not. Because this gauge fixing uh, fixed action, even though it has lost the original gauge symmetry, okay. there is a remnant of the original gauge symmetry of the, in this action, which is called the BRST symmetry. Okay. And using that, we can determine which operators are uh, good and which are not, without having to go back to the original gauge fixed, uh, gauge invariant like that. Okay. So the BRST invariance will, be, will play the role of gauge invariance of the original theory. But of course, it's a different kind of symmetry, right? It's, it's, not, it's not a symmetry which spoils the existence of propagator, okay, which gauge theory, uh, gauge symmetry was. So you, we can do everything in gauge uh, theory, okay, in this gauge fixed theory, without ever knowing about BRS symmetry. Okay. The only place where it's useful is in determining which operators are good. Okay. Because once you have give, you are given a gauge fixed action, you can calculate the any correlation function, right? Even the two-point function of the gauge fixed, okay, which is not gauge invariant. What is guaranteed is that as long as you calculate correlation functions of original gauge invariant operators, then the result doesn't depend on the choice of gauge. Okay. What BRST invariance tells you is it gives you a way to determine which are those operators without having to know about what the original gauge symmetry was. So this we will discuss in the uh, in later in the course. Suppose we have a gauge invariant action, we want to gauge fix. Yes. We can do it by uh, Adding the uh, gauge fixing term as a Lagrange one there and do the procedure. Yes, you can do that. I mean, introducing this delta function is similar to that. Yes, but uh, then we, we will not get ghosts, right? And uh, how can we introduce ghosts? The point is the ghosts are needed, as, as you saw. We don't have to have the ghosts, we have a determinant, right? So when you change integration variables, See, if we didn't want to change integration variables, there will be no determinant for anything else. Right? So the point is, when you try to change integration variables, you can introduce Lagrange multiplier, but ultimately you have to make sure that you are changing your change of integration variables is such that you can factor out the part which is integration over the group volume. Right? In that process, you will encounter a determinant, and that determinant you represent by it as integrals over the host. The ghost fields are purely auxiliary construction that we use so that you can represent the determinant and get some five microns. Okay, again in lattice gauge theory, you don't need to do any, any of this. Okay. Or if you have some other way of evaluating the determinant okay. without having to uh, introduce ghosts, that's also perfectly fine. Exactly. Okay, so what you have do, we are doing here is design so that we can do part of it. Okay, because now we really have a regular action okay, with some additional fields. And the quadratic part is perfectly uh, good so that you can define propagators. Okay, and we can now uh, use perturbation theory. Basically, the perturbation parameter will be this coupling constant G. Okay, because you will see that all the interaction terms depend on G. Whereas the free part doesn't depend on G, the quadratic. 